Welcome to Jeremy's IT Lab. This is a free complete course for the CCNA. If you like these videos, please subscribe to follow along with the series. Also, please like and leave a comment and share the video to help spread this free series of videos. Thanks for your help. In this video, we will continue our studies of IPv6. As a reminder, these are the specific exam topics relevant to IPv6. In today's video, we will focus on 1.9, learning about various IPv6 address types. In day 31, I briefly introduced global unicast and link local IPv6 addresses, but this time let's go more in depth and also learn about the other types. Here's what we'll cover. First up, we'll continue with the topic of IPv6 address configuration. I'll show you one more way to configure an IPv6 address on an interface, specifically using something called modified EUI64, which, if you were looking carefully, you might have noticed is exam topic 1.9.f. Next, I'll go into the other IPv6 address types. Global unicast, unique local, link local, multicast, and some others. This is going to be a very information-dense video, but it's all important information, so take your time. Use the flashcards, and make sure you know the topics in this video. As always, make sure to watch until the end of the video for a bonus practice question from Boson XSIM for CCNA. XSIM, made by Boson Software, is the best and most accurate set of practice exams out there. In my experience, they simulate the style and difficulty of the real CCNA and CCNP exams very well. If you want to check out Boson XSIM, follow the link in the video description. Let's get right into the topic. First up is configuring IPv6 addresses using a method called EUI64. EUI stands for Extended Unique Identifier. When using this concept in IPv6, the technically correct term is modified EUI64, but usually it's just referred to as EUI64. This topic can actually go quite deep, and it's really not necessary to know all the details for the CCNA. So just be aware that you might hear the name Modified EUI64, or just EUI64. For our purpose, they are the same. EUI64 is a method of converting a 48-bit MAC address into a 64-bit interface identifier. And this interface identifier can then become the host portion of a slash 64 IPv6 address. An IPv6 address, as you know, is 128 bits, so slash 64 means 64 bits are the network portion, and 64 bits are the host portion of the address. Let's walk through how to convert the MAC address to the EUI64 interface identifier. When you actually configure this on the router, this will be done automatically, but you should know how to do it. The first step is to divide the MAC address, the MAC address of the interface, in half. For example, if the MAC address is 12345678908AB, the middle is here, in between 6 and 7. Now we have the two halves of the MAC address. The next step is to insert hexadecimal FFFE in the middle. So in between 6 and 7, insert FFFE. Now there's one more step. Invert the 7th bit. If the 7th bit is a 0, make it a 1. If the 7th bit is a 1, make it a 0. This is trickier than the first two steps, but after day 31's video, you should feel comfortable working with hexadecimal and binary. So, where is the 7th bit in this modified MAC address? It's the 3rd bit of this 2. Remember, each hexadecimal digit is 4 bits. So the 1 is bits 1, 2, 3, and 4. Then the 2 is bits 5, 6, 7, and 8. So this bit here, the 3rd bit of the hexadecimal 2, is the 7th bit. It's a 1, so I converted it to 0. Convert it back to hexadecimal, and now the process is complete. This is the interface ID, and it's 64 bits. It will simply be added onto the network prefix to make the complete IPv6 address. Before I move on to explain more, here are a few practice questions. Convert each MAC address to an EUI64 interface identifier. Remember the three steps. 1. Split the MAC address in half. 2. Insert FFFE in the middle, and 3. Invert the 7th bit. Pause the video now to convert the MAC addresses. 
Okay, here are the answers. If you want some more practice, try writing out some random MAC addresses and finding the EUI64 interface identifier. Here's how to configure an interface using EUI64. First on G00, I used the command IPv6 address, followed by the network prefix, 2001 db8 double colon slash 64, and then finally EUI64. That's it. That tells the router to use this prefix, plus the EUI64 interface identifier, to generate an IPv6 address. I also did the same on G01 and G02. So let's check the actual IPv6 addresses that were configured. First up, I used show interfaces to check the MAC address of each interface. Here they are. Note that the MAC address of each interface is nearly identical, only the last digit is different. So their EUI64 interface identifiers will be very similar too. If you want, try pausing the video here to figure out the IPv6 address that was generated on each interface. But let's check now. Here's show IPv6 interface brief. And here's G00's IPv6 address. Notice that EUI64 changed the C of the MAC address to an E. And here's the FFFE inserted in the middle of the MAC address to make it 64 bits in length. And here are the addresses of G01 and G02. As I said, they are very similar because the MAC addresses used to generate the IPv6 addresses were very similar too. So to summarize, EUI64 allows routers to automatically generate an IPv6 address by expanding their MAC address to a 64-bit interface ID, which is then combined with the specified IPv6 address prefix. Before moving on, let me briefly explain something you might be wondering. I don't think you need to know this for the CCNA, but I'm sure I'll get some questions, so let me briefly explain why the 7th bit is inverted from 1 to 0, or 0 to 1. MAC addresses can be divided into two types. UAAs, Universally Administered Addresses, which are the unique MAC addresses assigned to the device by the manufacturer. There are also LAAs, Locally Administered Addresses. These are MAC addresses which are manually assigned by an admin or a protocol. In Cisco IOS, you can manually configure a MAC address with the MAC address command on an interface. These MAC addresses don't have to be globally unique. You can identify a UAA or LAA by the 7th bit of the MAC address, which is called the UL bit, Universal Local Bit. If the UL bit is set to 0, it's a UAA. If the UL bit is set to 1, it's an LAA. However, in the context of IPv6 addresses and EUI64, the meaning of the UL bit is reversed. If the UL bit is set to 0, it means that the MAC address, the EUI64 interface ID was made from, was an LAA. If it's set to 1, it means that the MAC address the EUI64 interface ID was made from was a UAA. Note that this doesn't actually affect the function of the IPv6 address itself. It doesn't mean the IPv6 address is universal or local. If you want to know the exact reasons for this switch, do a Google search for EUI64 packetlife.net. There is a great explanation there. It's fun to get into the details, but we're moving outside of the scope of a CCNA course now, so let's move on. So, EUI64 isn't really a type of IPv6 address. It's a method of automatically generating an IPv6 address using a specified prefix and a MAC address. Now let's talk about an actual defined type of IPv6 address. That is the global unicast address exam topic 1.9a. I briefly mentioned them in day 31. Global unicast IPv6 addresses are public addresses, which can be used over the internet. We haven't talked about public and private IPv4 addresses yet, but that will be coming up soon. You must register to use global unicast addresses. Because they are public addresses, it is expected that they are globally unique. If two companies use the same global unicast address range, there are going to be problems, like two homes having the exact same street address. The range of addresses to be used for global unicast addresses was originally defined as 2000 double colon slash 3, which includes all addresses from 2000 followed by seven quartets of zeros through 3FFF 
followed by seven quartets of Fs. That's a lot of addresses, but this was later updated to include many more addresses. Now, all addresses which aren't reserved for other purposes are global unicast addresses. Here's an example of a global unicast address, which I showed you in day 31. Let's go over it again. This blue part is the 48-bit global routing prefix, which is assigned to the company by the ISP. The company is free to use this slash 48 block of addresses however they want. However, because IPv6 addresses usually use a slash 64 prefix length, that means that these remaining 16 bits in the prefix are the subnet identifier, which can be used to make various subnets. 16 bits allows for over 65,000 subnets, more than enough for almost any purpose. These two parts together make up the IPv6 network prefix. Finally, the second half of the address, the host portion of the address in IPv4, is called the interface identifier in IPv6. This can be generated with EUI64 as shown before, or manually configured however you want. So remember these three parts of an IPv6 global unicast address. Global routing prefix, subnet identifier, and interface identifier. Next up, we'll look at unique local addresses, topic 1.9b. Unique local IPv6 addresses are private addresses which cannot be used over the internet. These are like private IPv4 addresses. Again, we haven't covered them yet, but they're coming up soon. You do not need to register to use them. They can be used freely within internal networks and don't need to be globally unique. I put an asterisk next to that sentence because, as you'll see soon, you should still try to make the addresses unique. Note that these addresses can't be routed over the internet. Your ISP will simply drop packets destined for unique local addresses. The address block fc00 double colon slash 7 is reserved for unique local addresses. However, a later update requires that the 8th bit be set to 1, so really all unique local addresses will begin with fd. Here's an example of a unique local address. Let's break down the parts. First up, fd simply indicates that this is a unique local address. fd is the unique local address range. The next 40 bits are called the global ID. It is recommended that this part of the address be randomly generated. Why randomly generate it and not just use something simple like all zeros? The global ID should be unique so that addresses don't overlap when companies merge. If all companies use the simple global ID of all zeros, when two companies merge and connect their networks, they might have the same subnet in different parts of the network, which can cause a lot of problems. By randomly generating this global ID, the chances of having duplicate subnets are very low. So even though these unique local addresses don't have to be globally unique, it's still a good idea to randomly generate the global ID and try to make it globally unique. Okay, the next part of the address is the subnet identifier, just like in a global unicast address. And these first 64 bits make up the network prefix. Once again, you don't have to use a slash 64 prefix length but that's the standard prefix length for IPv6. Then the last 64 bits are the interface ID, just like global unicast addresses. Next up, link local addresses, topic 1.9c on the exam topics list. Link local IPv6 addresses are automatically generated on IPv6 enabled interfaces, as you have already seen. Note that you can use the command IPv6 enable to enable IPv6 on an interface without actually configuring an IPv6 address on it. It will then automatically generate a link local IPv6 address, and that will be the only IPv6 address on the interface. Link local addresses use the address block fe80 double colon slash 10. However, the standard states that the 54 bits after fe80 slash 10 should all be zero. So you won't actually see any link local addresses beginning with FE9, FEA, or FEB. Only FE8. Then the interface ID is generated using EUI64 rules. Here's the same output of show IPv6 interface brief that I showed you before. Notice that each link local address uses the same interface ID as the global unicast address we configured. That's because both used EUI64 to generate the interface ID. Link local means that these addresses are used for communication within a single link, a single subnet. 
Routers will not route packets with a link local destination IPv6 address. They will not forward the packets between subnets. So what are some actual uses of link local addresses? For example, routing protocol peerings. OSPF v3, used for IPv6, uses link local addresses for neighbor adjacencies, sending LSAs, etc. They can also be used as the next top address for static routes. And neighbor discovery protocol, NDP, which is IPv6 as a replacement for ARP, uses link local addresses to function. I'll talk about NDP as well as IPv6 routing in day 33, but let me show you a small example. This is just an example of one use for link local addresses. So PC1 in the 2001 db 801 double colon slash 64 subnet wants to send this packet to PC2 in the 2001 db 802 double colon slash 64 subnet. It sends the packet to its default gateway, 2001 db 801 double colon 1, which is R1. R1 looks up the destination 2001 db 802 double colon 2 in its routing table, and the next hop is FE80 double colon 3, so it forwards the packet to R2. R2 looks up the destination 2001 db 802 double colon 2 in its routing table, and finds the next top of FE80 double colon 5, so it forwards the packet to R3. R3 looks up the destination 2001 db 802 double colon 2 in its routing table, and finds the next top address of FE80 double colon 7, so it forwards the packet to R4, which forwards it to PC2. Notice that in this part of the network, the routers only have link local addresses. So R1, for example, couldn't send a ping to R3. If R1 tried to ping R3 at FE80 double colon 5, the packet would simply be dropped because the destination is a link local address. It won't be routed. However, for next top addresses, these link local addresses work just fine. No need for any global unicast or unique local addresses on these interfaces. Anyway, as I said, I'll talk more about IPv6 routing in day 33. I just wanted to show you one use for link local addresses. Next up, let's look at multicast addresses in IPv6, which is topic 1.9e. For review, unicast addresses are used for one-to-one -one communication. A unicast packet is from one source to one destination. Broadcast addresses are used for one-to-all communication, from one source to all destinations within the subnet. Multicast addresses are used for one-to-many communications, from one source to multiple destinations, those hosts that have joined the specific multicast group. IPv6 uses the range FF00 double colon slash 8 for multicast. In the next slide, I'll summarize some important multicast addresses, but let me tell you one different thing about IPv6 compared to IPv4. IPv6 doesn't use broadcast. There is no broadcast address in IPv6. But there is a way to send a message to all hosts in the subnet using multicast, which I'll show you in the next slide. Here's a chart of some important multicast addresses, both IPv6 and IPv4 versions. You should know all of these multicast addresses for the CCNA. Here's something that might help you remember them. Notice that the IPv4 and IPv6 versions use the same last digit. For example, the all OSPF routers multicast address is FF02 double colon 5 in IPv6 and 224.0.0.5 in IPv4. The all EIGRP routers multicast address is FF02 double colon A in IPv6. Remember, hexadecimal A is 10 in decimal and it's 224.0.0.10 in IPv4. Now let me point out this multicast address, the all nodes multicast address. You also might hear it called the all hosts multicast address. Basically, it functions like a broadcast, since it's destined for all hosts like a broadcast. So that's how IPv6 can perform broadcasts, by sending traffic to this multicast address. Here's another aspect of IPv6 multicast addresses, called scopes. IPv6 defines multiple multicast scopes, which indicate how far the multicast packet should be forwarded. By the way, the addresses in the previous slide all use the link local scope, which stays in the local subnet. Note that this is a different concept than an IPv6 link local address, 
which begins with FE80. These are IPv6 multicast addresses with a link local scope. Here are a few of the IPv6 multicast scopes. First up, interface local multicast addresses begin with FF01. These multicast messages don't actually leave the local device. It can be used to send traffic to a service running within the local device, but the router won't actually send traffic out of a physical interface. You might see the term node local used for this scope also. Next is the link local scope using FF02. As I said before, these multicast addresses stay within the local subnet and are not routed between subnets. Okay, the next few scopes are a little less simple. Interface local and link local are clearly defined and don't need any special configuration. However, site local multicasts, beginning with FF05, can actually be forwarded by routers. By definition, they should be limited to a single physical location and not forwarded over a WAN. However, it's up to the network engineer to configure the actual scope, how far the site local multicast will actually travel. This is way beyond the scope of the CCNA, so just remember the name and that site local multicasts begin with FF05. Same for the next type, organization local multicasts, which begin with FF08. These are intended to be wider in scope than site local multicasts. For example, the scope might be to all subnets in the company or organization. Once again, it's up to the network engineers to configure the boundaries of the scope. One more scope you should be aware of is global, using FF0E. Basically, it's a wider scope than organization local, and these multicast messages can even be routed over the public internet. They are defined as having no boundaries, but that doesn't mean a global multicast message will actually be sent to every destination all over the internet. Exactly how these scopes work is beyond the CCNA, but Cisco expects you to be aware of these different scopes, know their names, and know how to identify them using the fourth hexadecimal character in the address. To help you visualize those different scopes, here's a diagram. From PC1's perspective, if it sends a link local multicast, it would reach these devices, all on the local subnet. A site local multicast might reach these devices, wider than link local, but not being sent over the WAN to another of the company's sites. An organization local multicast might reach these devices, including the devices in another office connected with a WAN link. Finally, the global scope can reach beyond the organization itself. Again, aside from interface local and link local, the actual boundaries of each scope needs to be defined by the network engineer, and multicast configuration is way beyond the CCNA. So, that brief introduction to IPv6 multicast scopes should be enough for now. Before moving on to the next address type, I want to point out something from the output of show IPv6 interface. This is the same router we configured the EUI64 addresses on earlier, and we're looking at its G00 interface. Here's what I want to show you, joined group addresses. These are the multicast groups that R1 has joined on this interface. FF02, double colon one. Which multicast address is this? It's the all nodes or all hosts multicast address. And notice that the scope is link local. R1's G00 is a host in the 2001 DB8 double colon slash 64 subnet. So it joins the all hosts multicast group in that subnet automatically. It also joined multicast group FF02 double colon two. What's that one? It's the all routers multicast group. R1 is a router, so it joins this multicast group automatically also. It also joins this multicast group. This is a special one. I'll talk about this kind of multicast address in day 33. Now let's move on to the next kind of IPv6 address. The next kind of address is Anycast, which is topic 1.9D of the exam topics list. Anycast is a new feature of IPv6. Anycast messaging is one to one of many. To help you understand that, here are some helpful diagrams from Wikipedia. The top three we just reviewed. Unicast at the top is one to one. Broadcast is one to all. Multicast is one to many, or one to multiple. And Anycast is one to one of many, or you could say one of multiple. There are multiple possible destinations, but the traffic is only sent to one. 
How does that work? Multiple routers are configured with the same IPv6 address. They use a routing protocol to advertise the address. So when hosts send packets to that destination address, other routers will forward it to the nearest router configured with that IP address. Nearest refers to the smallest routing protocol metric. Unlike the other address types I introduced today, there is no specified range for anycast addresses. Use a regular unicast address, for example, a global unicast or unique local address, and specify it as an anycast address. Here's an example. I configured it using slash 128, which is like a slash 32 IPv4 address. So if I activate a routing protocol on this interface, a host route to this specific address will be advertised to other routers. Here's that example in the CLI. Configure it like a regular IPv6 address and add the word anycast to the end of the command. Looking at show IPv6 interface G00, it now has two IPv6 addresses. On top is the EUI64 address we configured earlier, as indicated by EUI at the end here. Under it is the anycast address we just configured, indicated by any at the end. Note that even though this is an anycast address, it is still listed under global unicast addresses in this command, but this any at the end tells us it is anycast. To finish up, here are two other IPv6 addresses. First up, the unspecified IPv6 address of all zeros, usually just written as a double colon. It can be used when a device doesn't know its IPv6 address yet. IPv6 default routes are configured to double colon slash zero, which you'll see in day 33. The IPv4 equivalent of this address is 0.0.0.0. The last IPv6 address I want to introduce is double colon one. So 127 bits of zero followed by a single one. This is the IPv6 loopback address. It's used to test the protocol stack on the local device. Messages sent to this address are processed within the local device, but not sent to other devices. The IPv4 equivalent is the 127.0.0.0/8 address range. Instead of wasting a huge block of addresses for loopbacks, IPv6 uses just a single address, which is much more efficient. That was a lot of information, I'm sure you agree. Here's what we covered. I showed you another way of configuring IPv6 addresses, by making the router automatically generate an interface ID using EUI64. We looked at some IPv6 address types. Global unicast addresses are public IPv6 addresses, which can be routed over the internet. Remember the three sections of a global unicast address, the global routing prefix, the subnet identifier, and the interface identifier. Then we looked at unique local addresses. No registration is needed to use IPv6 addresses in this range. You're free to use them in your internal networks, but these addresses aren't routed over the internet. Next, we looked at link local IPv6 addresses. These are automatically configured when you enable IPv6 on an interface. You can do that by configuring another IPv6 address, such as a global unicast address on an interface, or you can just use the IPv6 enable command on the interface, which will enable IPv6 on the interface and automatically configure a link local address. Then we looked at IPv6 multicast addresses, including some common reserved multicast addresses used for OSPF, RIP, and EIGRP. We also covered the different multicast scopes. You don't need to understand them to a deep level, but be familiar with the concept. We looked at a few others too, specifically anycast addresses, which are used to send traffic to one destination out of multiple possible destinations. Also the unspecified IPv6 address, which is all zeros and usually just written as a double colon, and the IPv6 loopback address, which is simply written as double colon one. This lesson had a lot of information, so go back and learn each topic one by one if you need to. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. However, I won't give any detailed explanations of these topics beyond the scope of the CCNA. If you want to go more in depth, Google is your friend. As always, watch until the end of today's quiz for a bonus question from Boson XSIM for CCNA, the best practice exams for the CCNA. Okay, let's move on to question one of today's quiz. 
R1's G01 interface has a MAC address of 0D2A, 4FA3, 00B1. What will G01's IPv6 address be after issuing the following command? IPv6 address 2001db801 double colon slash 64 EUI 64. Here are the options. Pause the video here to find the correct answer. The answer is D. The seventh bit of the MAC address has been inverted to a 1, changing the D in the MAC address to an F. Also, FFFE has correctly been inserted into the middle of the MAC address to expand it to 64 bits. OK, let's go to question 2. Which portion of the IPv6 address below is the global ID? Here are the options, the red indicating the global ID. So which option is correct? Pause the video to find the correct answer. OK, the correct answer is B. This is a unique local IPv6 address. After FD, the next 40 bits, 10 hexadecimal characters, form the global ID. This portion of the address should be randomly generated so that subnets don't overlap in the case that two companies merge. OK, let's go to question 3. R3 sent an IPv6 multicast message to all other routers on the local subnet. What was the destination IPv6 address of that message? Select the best answer. A. FF01 double colon 1. B. FF01 double colon 2. C. FF02 double colon 1. Or D. FF02 double colon 2. Pause the video to think about your answer. The answer is D. FF02 double colon 2. First, look at the scope of each option. FF01, as in A and B, is for interface local, also known as node local, multicast messages. Those won't be sent to devices on the local subnet. For that, a link local multicast message, like in C or D, is used. However, FF02 double colon 1, as in C, is a message to all hosts on the local subnet, not just routers. D is the correct answer. FF02 double colon 2 is the link local multicast address for all routers. OK, let's go to question 4. What kind of IPv6 address is automatically configured on an interface when the following command is used? Select the best answer. The command is IPv6 enable. A, unique local. B, node local. C, link local. Or D, EUI64. Pause the video to think about your answer. The answer is C, link local. IPv6 enable enables IPv6 on the interface and causes a link local address to be automatically configured. IPv6 enabled interfaces must have a link local address in addition to whatever other IPv6 addresses you might configure on them. In creating the link local address, the router does use the EUI64 process, so some of you might have selected D. However, that isn't the correct name of the type of address, so D is not correct. OK, let's go to question 5. The diagrams on the right visualize different IPv6 message types. Match them with the correct message type. Here are the message types. Unicast, broadcast, multicast, and anycast. Pause the video to think about your answers. Let's check the answers. Unicast is 3, from the source to one specific destination. Broadcast is 2, from the source to all possible destinations. Multicast is 4, from the source to multiple destinations. And Anycast is 1, from the source to one of multiple possible destinations. OK, that's all for the quiz. Let's move on to a bonus question from Boson Exim for CCNA. OK, here's today's Boson XM practice question. Which of the following IPv6 address prefixes are not routable? Select two choices. So what does that mean, not routable? It means if a router receives a packet and the destination is in one of these prefix ranges, the router will not forward the packet. It will not route the packet. So how about A, 
2000 double colon slash three. This is not one of the correct answers because this is the global unicast range and global unicast addresses are routable. How about B, FV80 double colon slash 10? So this is one of the correct answers. This address prefix is not routable because this is a link local prefix range and link local addresses can only be used in the local link, the local subnet. Okay, next C and D, these are both in the unique local range and unique local addresses are routable. They cannot be routed over the public internet. Your ISP will drop the traffic, but within internal networks, these addresses can be used freely and they can be routed between subnets. And then E and F, these are both multicast addresses. You can tell by the FF at the beginning, but look at the scope FF05 for E, that is site local and FF02 for F, that is link local. Site local multicasts can be routed outside of the local subnet. So E is not one of the answers. However, F, link local, is one of the correct answers. Much like the link local address, the link local scope of a multicast address also is not routable outside of the local subnet, the local link. Okay, so let's see if my answers are correct. Down here, I will click on show answer, and they are correct. So I will scroll down and you can pause here if you want to read Boson's explanation. And there's more down here. So as you can see, the explanation is quite detailed, quite lengthy. Um, these explanations are really one of the great things about Boson XM. So I highly recommend after taking one of the practice exams in Boson XM, Read the explanations for every single question, both the ones you get right and the ones you get wrong. It will really help you deepen your understanding of the topics and feel comfortable when you take the real exam. Okay, so that's Boson XM for CCNA. If you want to get Boson XM for yourself, follow the link in the video description. There are supplementary materials for this video. There is a flashcard deck to use with the software Anki. Note that I have added the tag IPv6 to all flashcards for this video and Day 31's video. So you can use Anki to specifically review the IPv6 cards if you feel it is necessary. There was a lot to memorize in this video, so I think the flashcards will be very helpful. There will also be a packet tracer practice lab, so you can get some hands-on practice. That will be in the next video. Sign up for my mailing list via the link in the description and I'll send you all of the flashcards and packet tracer lab files for the course. Before finishing today's video, I want to thank my JCNP level channel members. To join, please click the join button under the video. Thank you to Brandon, Magrathia, Njabulo, Benjamin, Deepak, Tepiso, Justin, Neil, Prakash, Nasir, Erlison, Apogee, Wasim, Marco, Florian, Daming, Kony, Joshua, Jilmar, Samil, Ed, Value, John, Funny Dart, Scott, Hassan, Gerard, Marek, Velva Jacob, C Mode, Johan, Mark, Yusuf, CD, Boson Software, Charlesetta, Devin, Lito, Jonathan, and Vance. Sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly, but thank you so much for your support. One of you is still displaying as channel failed to load. If this is you, please let me know and I'll see if YouTube can fix it. This is the list of JCNP level members at the time of recording, by the way. October 19th, 2020. If you signed up recently and your name isn't on here, don't worry, you'll be in future videos. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment, and share the video with anyone else studying for the CCNA. If you want to leave a tip, check the links in the description. I'm also a Brave verified publisher and accept BAT or basic attention token tips via the Brave browser. That's all for now.